Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the June edition of the Atlanta Innovation Forum's monthly meetings. We're so pleased you can join us today. We hope everybody's healthy, safe on the family side, as well as on the business side. And we're excited to spend the next hour with you. We have an absolutely fabulous presentation and looking forward to you joining us. Tonight's program is all about innovating while riding the IoT tsunami. We have a fabulous set of panelists, Joe, Cole, and Sridhar, who you can hear about very shortly. And we have a wonderful top innovator tonight, Lily over at Sensor Call, which I think is going to bring it home that says you don't have to be an enterprise organization or a consumer play to uh, see a small, successful, small business deliver IoT solutions into the places that matter. We wouldn't be here without the support of our sponsors. I know you hear it from us all the time, and we really need to consider them and thank them. And I hope you've really enjoyed our sponsor spotlights we've been sending out over the last couple of months. As always, we want to thank RightPoint, Carabiner Communications, Stone Resource Group, Stable Colonel, who's helped us put on this meeting tonight, and Cox, who's our cornerstone sponsor for Women Driving Innovation. Thank you for all of you, and without your support, um, we wouldn't be able to put on these programs. We have a wonderful set of panels throughout the summer. We know everybody's still a little bit locked down, so we are going to have a July meeting this month. And we developed a wonderful panel for women driving innovation on as COVID made the business case for 5G. We got an incredible group of presenters. You're going to hear some real insights. And I encourage you to mark your calendars and keep an eye out for the uh, emailers to letting you know about the meeting and registering and signing up. We really appreciate it. In addition to our July event online, our August event is going to be online as well. We're in the early stages of developing a telehealth session, talking about virtual care, telehealth, and is this going to be the new normal? I know many of us have had the opportunity to participate on some of these calls. I know for myself, I hope it doesn't go away. And in talking to a couple of doctors, I know they're actually liking it more because once they figured out how to use it, they can turn around and actually have an increase in their patient load, which is all good for them and hopefully good for us. Um, we got a wonderful, exciting panel, and if any of you might have some interest in participating or know some great speakers, please feel, re uh, feel free to reach out to us, info at atlantainnovationforum.org. We'd love to hear from you. Without further ado, I'd like to bring up Lily Varzi. She's a co-founder of Sensor Call. Sensor Call is doing some incredible things in the home health and home care protection area. And for those of you who have parents or people that need more around the clock monitoring that one can even do, we strongly encourage you to uh, get excited about this. And I'll, I'll, let me call up Lily now. Come on on and I'll see you back in three minutes, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. Uh, let me take a few minutes and um, tell you guys why we started Sensors Call <clears throat> and uh, developed our product, Care Alert. I have an 85-year-old mother who's um, independent, she lives alone, and still loves to drive. Um, one night around 11 o'clock at night, I called her cell phone and she didn't answer. I called her landline over and over. It was busy as if it was disconnected. You can imagine my heart was just jumping out of my chest. So my husband and I jumped in, in the car, drove to her house, got inside using my key, and thank God she was safe and sound, sitting at the kitchen table watching television. Uh, of course, I'm like, mom, you're not answering the phone. She was happy to see me, but very angry. And I quote, she literally said, why are you treating me like a child? This happened over and over again. She's got those emergency pendants, but she hates to wear them around her neck. 
We tried to install cameras, but that didn't go well. My husband and I have both been in te technology for years, and he's the creative one and extremely knowledgeable in IoT. And that evening, right there and then, he said, Lily, I've got to come up with a solution. You cannot be the only caregiver in the world who goes through these panicky moments about her mom. And that's how Sensors Call was developed, was created. Our product, um, next slide, please. Our product, Care Alert, uh, looks like a nightlight and it acts as a nightlight. You plug it into the wall, depending on the size of the house, you probably need two or three of them. And it uses, it's got many sensors inside it and they use um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to learn the pattern of your loved one's behavior. So it takes about seven to 10 days to master those behaviors, such as what, what time do they normally wake up? What time do they go to bed? How long the shower takes? And what it does is, one of the key features is that it alerts the caregiver on their smartphone when something abnormal happens. So for example, my mother normally wakes up at 9.30 a.m. If by 9.45 she's not up, I get an alert. The other extremely important feature it has is you can, it's got a two-way communication capability. So as soon as I push a button on my app, I can talk to my mother in real time via one of the devices that's on that's plugged into the wall. I can say, mom, your, your phone is not hung up, or how are you? Um, and another key feature is that um, I can record medication uh, reminders or any reminder using my own voice, and the reminders come off from the devices in my mom's house at a certain time, like it's 2 p.m., mom, don't forget to take your cholesterol medication, or mom, I'm coming to pick you up, you know, in a couple of, in an hour or so to take you to the doctor. Um, there are no cameras and it does not listen to words. Um, so there's nothing like it in the market and we're very excited about it. Care Alert is getting smarter every day as we collect more data. And in the near future, it can maybe detect loneliness or depression and so forth. Next slide, please. So we're very excited. We are attending a crowdfunding in middle of July. We'd love to have you guys participate by going to this website, getcarealert.com. We have some, many pilots, but we would love to have more pilots. So we would love to ask your help to introduce us to any pilot sites. And we're also looking for strategic partners, such as in the senior, independent senior living and strategic investors. We are self-funded, uh, but having investors that have already invested in places such as senior living uh, would really help us tremendously. Um, thank you for your time. I'm back at the end of the session to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Lily. Absolutely fabulous job. I can see why you're excited about it. I'm excited about it. And, I, and as I told you, I want to talk to you about a possible pilot opportunity. And I'm, I see a very, very, very bright future for what you're doing. You're solving a monster problem in a monster market. And you're solving it in so much more tasteful way than so many of the other solutions out there that are so intrusive in your face and uh, feel like they're spying on you. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you later on in the session on the Q&A. Thanks, Appreciate Lily. It. Thanks. So let me call up Joe Conway, CEO of Stable Kernel. Joe's going to lead our Thank panel you. today. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? Great. And what I'd like to do, Joe, is let me just let me just turn this over to you. Bring up Tridar and Cole. Let's get the show on the road. I'm going to get out of your hair, and I'll see you at the back end, uh, telling you what a great do job you did at the be at during the session. You take care, and I'll be back in a little bit. Sounds good. Hey, everybody. I'm Joe Conway, and I'm the CEO of Stable Kernel. Stable Kernel is a company that commercializes software solutions taking everything from a con from a concept through research through pilots through the commercialization of that product and then supporting it long term uh, a lot of our solutions focus on creating brand new digital channels that are uh, mobile applications browser based applications for a particular market segment and then making sure that we're capturing a lot of the behavior and data that comes out of that usage to turn around and provide greater insights to the business that owns the solution as well as the customers that use it uh, so that's a little bit about a stable kernel. I also want to introduce Cole Nicholson from Creature Comforts Brewery, and he can hey. tell you a little about himself. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Cole Nicholson, and I'm the Senior Manager of Business Intelligence at Creature Comforts Brewing Company. 
Uh, and essentially, my job role is to help my coworkers answer actual questions, and IoT integration sort of serves as a tool for us. Um, for background, Creature Comforts is one of the larger craft breweries in America, but we're still relatively a small company. Uh, we actually have two locations. Our first, our OG, uh, very, imagine the beer making process is a very manual process over there, right? So we have guys and girls slinging bags of grain, dumping buckets of hops, uh, turning switches, pushing buttons, all that great stuff. But on our newer side, um, a lot more automation, right? So it's a perfect place for connecting everything, tons of equipment communication. And so what we've then sort of worked to do is um, sort of hybridize the old world that we lived in and the new world that we lived in um, and sort of approach this human manual entry to machine and machine communication data collection. Um, yeah, and super excited to talk about it with you all and, and thanks for having me. Sridhar from Dober. Sure. Tell us about you. Hey. Sure, sure. Hello everyone, I'm Sridhar Patnal. I'm the VP of Software Development here in Dover Corporation. Uh, Dover is an industrial manufacturing company. I lead the digital transformation engineering team over there, uh, both on IoT side as well as the rest of the digital experience, which includes e-commerce, content management, and digital marketing and other digital initiatives. Uh, Dover is uh, actually it's a, a B2B industrial manufacturing company that uh, manufactures several things that you guys uh, use everyday basis but may not realize, such as if you go to the gas station, the dispensers that you use, car wash, we manufacture the car wash equipment. If you go to uh, Walmart, Costco's, um, then the end of the health refrigeration doors, we manufacture that and uh, the garbage trucks that collects your garbage. So it goes on and on. So we have about 18 companies underneath um, and uh, I'm responsible for leading the IoT platform out there. Happy to be here and uh, I'm excited to participate in the panel. Fantastic, fantastic. So, Cole, you've just recently gone through a connectivity initiative yourself. What were some of the things that made that initiative successful? Right. Well, first and foremost, good partners, right? Because this is really a new journey for us. Um, but I'll even speak to, you know, kind of how we got started of trying to figure out why we wanted this integration in the first place is that we were leaning into some self serve analytics platforms like Power BI. And then we're like, okay, this is great but it's, it's too, you know, we don't have the right structure behind us to get to where we need to get to. Um, updating Excel sheets, one, have their limits, and two, is an arduous task that really we have been living in that world for the last couple of years. Um, and so really, you know, the adoption of things like, you know, Azure and um, really being a cost-effective solution for us, right? We, like I said, small company, we would not be in this space if it wasn't, you know, um, relatively easy for us to get into um, and you know the two reasons for that is we had good partners and uh, yeah the money made sense. Sridhar what about you you've been involved in so many connectivity initiatives over the course of your lifetime what are the things that you find uh, make it successful? Yeah I, I think you know uh, IoT consists of a lot of parts including technology. Technology itself has several components in it um, but my experience um, has been it all starts with value, so the value identification. Uh, you need to really look at what value you're trying to create either for your company or for your customers. Uh, successful ones that I've been involved in are the ones that value identified earlier in the phase. It got vetted out with the customers, make sure that we are on the same phase with the customers and what we are trying to do, uh, and then you know, create a solution that fits to their needs. Um, then there is a lot of uh, nuances in making it successful. Um, including technology and um, uh, ROI calculations, and then uh, essentially uh, the operational aspects of its security, all of them need to be done properly for making them certainly successful, but it starts with the value in my opinion. Yeah, that makes sense, because especially, you know, it's what we've found too, is that IoT solutions, especially as they start to really infiltrate an organization, become valuable, become very expensive to maintain and support. Um, yeah. Just field services, the, the the hosting of it, the expensive software engineers and data scientists, um, the design that you need to get things into people's hands. Um, and so being able, in our experience at least, because we're going from zero to commercialized, you know, for us, same thing that Shudar said, setting the right KPIs up front, validating those KPIs through cost-effective testing, 
and then taking something to market only when you've proven that it's going to be a good idea to take it to market. And it's going to make more money than it costs. Would probably be a good a good starting yeah. point. <laughs> and one, one more thing I'll add to that is really it's very critical if anybody is actually thinking of going in that journey. Um, at least from my experience, I can say it's very critical to box what you're trying to do because the scope can really get creep up and uh, there a lot of coolness comes into the picture and IoT itself is buzzword and cool, right? So although it's not a brand new concept, it's been there for a long time. But really boxing what we call MVP or CVP. MVP is minimum viable product. CVP is commercially viable product. But one way or the other, regardless of which term you use, uh, that's very critical. So you essentially do a crawl walk phase, uh, crawl walk run phase in order to be successful. Um, otherwise, you could really um, slow down. And by the time market, someone else already, already going to be in the market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think right now we could actually ask a poll question. To, to the folks that are out there to figure out where they are on their IoT journey. And you have about 30 seconds to answer this one and um, it'll pop off the screen and then we'll be able to uh, discuss some of the answers and bridge it into our next question. Cool, are you in, in, inundated with data yet on your team? You know, um, when we started the process, right, we're like super excited, like bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Um, and I, I'm sure, as we'll talk about here, uh, not always the best idea if you don't necessarily know what to do with it. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> Tridar, do you guys have a giant data warehouse that you bring data into from a lot of different places? Oh, absolutely. The cloud providers would love to have us collect a lot and lots of data, actually. They, so, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so I think like Cole said, um, there's no shortage of data over there. and. Uh, we do, we do collect the data, but we have learned over a period that uh, it's not just about uh, how much amount of data, it's about what the right amount of data and what is the right, the data set and what do you do with it. But but yes, we do collect lots of data and we have data hubs, data lakes, data warehouses. Um, that's the data coming from devices as well as data coming from other, your IT systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of SAP integration and, and, and analysis tools and those sorts of things. Um, so it looks oh, yeah. like about half the folks here are still in the thinking about it journey. So I hope that a lot of this information is useful. Um, and some folks are well along the way. And uh, I'm really happy to see that there's some folks that are already really using data to, to drive the business, which is what we're seeing with a lot of customers right now as well. So we can go ahead and take those results down and we can pop into our next question here, which is, what are the cool things that you guys are seeing connected today? Starting with you, Sridhar. What's exciting? Well, I, you know, I, I tell um, at least the people I know is that you know, the easiest IoT device people don't realize your phone. So it won't get better than that. So your iPhones, Android device you're using, they're already a cool device. I said, we all know that's why we invest 600 plus dollars. <laughs> some every year, some once in two years. But, but yes, yeah, so phones are... Uh, coolest devices but there's a lot of other cool devices coming up actually in the beer space i've heard uh things like if you if you are trying to um, identify when you are going to run out of the beer and automatic ordering of the beer to right down to your door so you don't even you can be complete couch potato so what can be better than that so <laughs> yeah cool what kind of things have you seen that have been really exciting i mean yeah the obvious answer has to be beer right i mean um when I entered into the, you know, Creature Comforts family, um, never really thought of that as what the opportunity was going to be there for. Um, you know, what I would say is, right, we talked about IoT as a buzzword. Um, what I'm really excited to see and like the poll sort of talks about is that I think um, people are open to have the conversation and the cool ways in which we'll be able to connect things. Um, you know, we're, we're just starting to roll into it because people are opening up their eyes to you know, what I hope is a not too hard solution. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just in what we've seen in, in our organization and the team and the companies that we've worked with is the cost to get into the connectivity game is, is decreasing. And so why not connect everything? And I just think about in the last year or two, just I can rattle off a list of things, right? We've connected paper towel and toilet dispensers and soap dispensers and foot traffic counters and concrete curing sensors and oxygen concentrators and restaurant machinery, um, door and gate locks, uh, utility meters, you know, your power meter that's sitting on the side of your house. 
And so what it really seems like is we're able to connect so many things now and automate the collection of data. And now that we're getting better at housing and analyzing data, we're really seeing how our world works and we're better able to make decisions about how to make it operate more efficiently and more effectively. Have you guys yeah, and I think one of the cool thing is the healthcare too, right? So healthcare IoT is uh, really taking off. And if we put our technology to better use, I'm sure saving lives is going to be certainly, I, it may not be cool, but at least it's, I'm sure we all can appreciate it. But yeah, so I think you're right. IoT with its cost going down, um, it has its own challenges. It's not without challenges, but certainly getting into your day-to-day -day life, uh, not, it's no longer just a convenience. It's actually more of a need going forward. I'm sure a lot of people have Nest thermometers at their at their homes, right? So previously, that's that that's a good it's convenience plus cost savings. So that's the type of solution that's really going to hit the market. Yeah, and I definitely on the healthcare side of things, even even you could take uh, Lily who spoke earlier and say hers is almost healthcare related in a sense too. And we look at people being quarantined in, in their in their homes right now that still have medical needs and still need to see a doctor to give you know to measure things with them and, and their levels and being able to have sensors that can operate in a person's home to measure some of those things or maybe how a medical device that they're using uh, avoids them having to go to that doctor in the first place, which as we know is, can be dangerous now with with uh, COVID and everything like that. Uh, so I think that, yeah, we're we're becoming bionic humans at this point. This is the next step in, next step in this. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, you know, you guys are obviously collecting a lot of data, terabytes of data. What are you guys doing with it these days, Cole? Yeah, so, you know, I have to preface and say, um, being that we're conscientious about the cost it takes to house that kind of data, um, we're not trying to strive for terabytes of information. One, because, you know, just because you capture it, you know, every millisecond or whatever, it doesn't mean it actually turns into action for you and, and your team. And so really for us, it's fighting this tension between um, we want to gather information now because we don't know what we don't know, but we want to be able to answer that in the future. And there are questions today that we do need to start answering. Um, but what IoT then gives us the opportunity to is say that, you know, we don't have the flexibility to bring all that data on board right now. Well, with the integration piece, then it's like flipping a switch to get that information to flow in. Whereas, you know, historically for us, you want to figure something out and it's, you know, you wish you knew the answer like six months ago. Well, that's, you know, tough. Good luck. Yeah, and, and I think, in, you know, in our case, we are looking at the, uh, we're not looking at IoT in a silo. Uh, for us, it's an overall digital experience. Uh, what I mean by that is IoT is providing you the data for one specific aspect of what your product is doing at a customer environment. We are trying to tie it back to the rest of the ecosystem that helps us provide 360 degree view of the customer. So ideally, we want to use to get there. That's our vision, to get, get to the point of where we know how the customer is coming into our platforms, or especially in our websites, and what they're trying to browse through and what products that they're interested in, when they purchase the product, where they actually install the product, what kind of uses that they're having, when the product is gonna need parts for it, and from there tied back into the service, right? So that's a life cycle of the part. So we are really interested in that. Uh, so the data that we collect, our goal is to be able to fulfill that vision. Uh, right now, uh, certainly it's a long journey because there's a lot need to happen in order to get there. Uh, but that's that's kind of our interest in getting the data collected in a way to get to that point. Yeah, and you guys both hit on something I think is kind of almost different uh, about the IoT conversation now than it was five years ago. Five years ago is collect everything, hope you'll need in the future. And then we've seen that, and you guys are like, no, don't do that. I totally agree with that because you know what we're seeing is number one, there's a cost to housing that data. Right. But if you really think about a lot of the data, the telemetry data that we collect in, in sensors and in IoT environments is you're going from low power devices that may not be able to be that expressive in the way that they share their data. And so there's a lot of cleaning and augmentation of that mm -hmm. data that has to occur. And there's a significant capital cost to providing that using data scientists and software engineers to write those ingestion pipelines. Um, just like a data analytics platform, an IoT platform is just really, a, you know, an ETL pipeline. You know, it's just that. The, we're extracting from is the outside world. Yeah, as long as you have the vision, it's okay. I mean, sometimes um, we, we have seen the cases where you do need to collect the data, although you may not have the solution. That comes into the picture where you're trying to train, especially your machine learning algorithms, right? Then you need a large data set. 
at that point, even if you just connect a device and you're collecting your data, you cannot really make much sense out of it. In situations like that, it's okay to collect the data and keep it because you're training your algorithm in-house over a couple of years so that it really gets refined, so it gets really accurate. Uh, those are intentionally you're making the decision to keep the data but again like I said, it's more about vision what do you want to do with it once you have the vision then you know what how much data to collect and what to do with it otherwise it's just collecting the data for it's okay for the poc state but once you go to the production then it's uh, certainly costs are going to add up yeah and one thing and maybe you guys have, have similar experiences you know, collecting data into a more expensive database solution that's more uh, quickly accessible so that you can use it directly in applications for customers um, and then collecting maybe this data that you're not quite sure to do with yet and putting it into more cold storage and a cheaper solution and then giving access to your um, to your right. analysts to that type of data. Is that something you guys see yeah. a lot of? Yeah, I mean, that's that's, you know, that's exactly it for us, right? We think about things in terms of blob, which will carry us into the future and then you know, when, we, when I talked at the beginning about how we um, hybridize human uh, manual entry and then IoT, that's where then that, you know, more robust solution has to come in and we have to think about getting data to them as it's, as it's you know, getting pinged. Yeah, that, that's right. Awesome, awesome. Very cool, very cool. Um, so, you know, that data as we're doing that analysis and Cole, obviously you do an awful lot of analysis as part, as part of your job. Are any of those decisions that the analysis or, or maybe insights that the analysis you're doing is coming to, are you able to automate those so that the decision is made without human intervention? Or is there still a human check that's happening along some of the decision points? Um, you know, it'll, it'll sound cliche, but uh, craft beer is a, a craft at that, right? And so there is an immense amount of both pride and, you know, intimate connection with everyone that I work with at Creature. Um, in terms of making sure that the beer is the best that it could possibly be for everybody uh, for all time. But um, so it is this interesting transition for us, right? Because we're really in this transition phase where, okay, we can now collect large amounts of, of data. And as we build a foundation to, you know, creating algorithms and feeding healthy data in, even then it's a, a transition for us to inherently build trust back with uh, everybody, right? In a very manual entry world, it is very, very easy for people to lose trust in what they're looking at. Um, one, because the speed isn't there for them, right? They might be looking at changes that are, you know, a few hours old. Um, and uh, the second part being that, yeah, what you fundamentally feed that algorithm is healthy data. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think we, we, we certainly use, um, uh, the data in the machine learning algorithms, we we do, I mean, again, it, it, it depends on the use case, but uh, we do have the use cases where we feed into algorithm. Uh, in the industrial world, um, there is still the element of manual operation exists because of the risk involved and the safety involved. Uh, you can just leave it for complete automation, although obviously, as you guys know, robotics and all are much more automated, but in the discrete manufacturing, it is still not there yet to the point where an algorithm will take the complete end to end decisions. Now, having said that, um, there's certainly a lot of things that can be automated, um, uh, whether it's a quality control, uh, some safety checks, not the safety closed loop, safety checks, for example, they can be automated. And uh, things such as uh, providing some alarms uh, through data processing and through the algorithm that can be automated. So certainly we use the data to make the right decisions and identify some usage patterns, right? So there are things that you don't want to mind-numbingly have somebody watch out the screen or a, a, a pump and just to tell you when some uh, some potential issue can happen, you can certainly put a camera, put an algorithm in there and then train it to look at certain patterns and then have it raise an alarm. So we do use the data to get to that point of making some intelligent decisions. Uh, but like I said, there is still a human element involved, especially in what we call closed loop action. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, you identify a condition and then you have to take an action in order to mitigate that specific condition. Uh, in those cases, still at this point, majority as a monitoring for the most part, that taking the action part still there is human element. Uh, not always, but for the most part still, at least in the industrial world. I'm sure we're going to get there to the point where it's completely 
we can train them to be uh, almost human, but I think that we are still some ways to go. The ultimate yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, exactly. Or we're just completely automated at that point. There was a movie about that. I believe it was Wall-E. Yes, it was a Disney movie. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So you guys, I mean, you guys are definitely saying that. You know, what's great about this data collection and analysis is it allows us to pri prioritize more effectively. We can get alerted to things that are important. We don't have to go through the data ourselves. We don't have to go through the manual collection process ourselves. We're making it much more efficient, but we're not turning over the, um, what's the right word, our, our, our agenda, right? We're not turning over yeah. our agenda machines quite yet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's still some checks and balances. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When do you think we're going to get there? When do you, when, Cole, when, when do we get to that utopia? Oh, boy. Um, you know what? I'm not even going to gamble to take a, take a guess. Um, yeah, we'll do, we'll say 2030. Why not? All right. Fair. <laughs> Sri are. I think it depends on which industry you are in. Um, you know, if you look at the defense and military and all, uh, that might be a different answer versus when you're in a food and pharma industry. It's a, it's almost at the at the risk levels and the level of automation needed. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, just to give you maybe a ballpark figure, I would think yeah, something along the lines of some might be fully automated from 2030 onwards. Some might be we might be. I mean, I was just actually listening to my son was attending some AI, AI class, he's in high school actually. And I was just listening to the instructor and um, uh, she was saying, they're trying to make the AI in such a way, right now it is at 50% of human level, they wanna make it 100% of human level by 2040 or so, and by 2060, they wanna be better than human level. And I was saying, why? <laughs> <laughs> But but yeah, I mean, if you go by that, then uh, we are probably another uh, 15 to 20 years uh, for making it to that level fully. Yeah. But but sense. but on the silver lining, I think again, uh, I don't mean to say the technology should not be evolved, and and certainly AI yeah, is a great use case. It's doing a lot of wonderful things. Uh, it's just a matter of how to how to use it effectively. That's the important thing, and then. Certainly, there's a great, a great amount of um, uh, R&D went in there, and that will continue to evolve. Yeah, yeah. And, and even to, to, to Cole's point, too, right, about having that clean data that's coming in there. I mean, data is just our current understanding of what we're perceiving in the world. And so if we have, we, there's, there's things that we don't see that might be critical to some of the decisions that we're making that we can't sense quite yet. And I think that's probably, too, that, you know, we're all thinking in our heads, like, we know how good computers are, but... Yeah, I don't want it to drive my car for me quite yet. <laughs> we don't we don't want the matrix world yet. <laughs> yes, not quite yet. <laughs> um, cool. So I do think, Abby, if you want to toss on that next poll right there for our audience, we can see what folks are thinking about. And I can't remember what the poll is about, so you're going to have to pop it up there for me. What is your biggest challenge with IoT? So again, you have about 30 seconds to, to solve that. Cole, Sridhar, what are you guys' biggest challenges with IoT? Um, you know, what I would say from a connectivity standpoint is we have this awesome conversation about connecting everything. But along with connecting everything also comes managing everything that's connected. Um, and so it's you'll be amazed the little things that will happen, you know, for us during the day, whether random power outage or whatever, that then breaks that loop for us, right? And so it's trying to be constantly focused to make sure everything is healthy and integrated and moving forward yeah absolutely should what about you yeah uh, it's certainly the world i live in i will say operationalization security those are the two at least i see a majority of the time um as the challenges uh, in the world i live in um, and i think there is room for improvement across the board on those two areas and analytics and connectivity side i feel like there's a lot of great strides being made but security and operationalization whether it's uh, technology evolving or not having enough education for the folks on how to do it smoothly, uh, there are still some gaps over there. Yeah, so it looks like uh, the polls, folks that are that responded to the polls here are having a similar experience. Um, you know, today, how are, Shudar, how are these devices being secured? And, and, and how do you guys as an organization think through your risk when you're looking at an IoT solution? Yeah, you know, I think uh, security is the, elephant in the room to be honest because security and operations i just mentioned but security more so uh, because um, whenever someone says security there is a lot of things involved in there uh, especially in the iot world we are talking about uh, the sensors to a specific device where the sensors are connected 
and from devices to cloud over a network and from inside the cloud then you have your applications and the data that you need to protect so you have security set of multiple layers you have at the edge layer and you have at the network layer and then you have at the cloud and application layer um, and i think cloud and application layer mostly a solved problem because it's been there for a while and cloud providers do a good job um, whoever that is I, I, it's not about one specific uh, cloud provider all of them do a good job for the most part so um, cloud has been yes you need to keep in mind but that's a solved problem as long as you can go through it uh, what they recommend you'll be okay but the areas that i feel there's still uh, gaps in there uh, from security side are on the edge side uh, from local connectivity between the sensor to the devices or device to back to the cloud and you need to worry about inbound data and outbound data what i mean by that is data coming into uh, because these devices are sitting in the customer environment so if you look at our if you look at our cases um, our customers are into all kinds of different segments right the chemical oil and gas defense and all of these and when you're putting your solutions over there and you're saying we'll connect it which means your devices now can talk to the cloud and certainly there's going to be an element of uh, un, un, um, uh, uncomfortability among them how well we are able to secure it so we have to go through a lot of hoops to prove to them that our devices are secure so that's where i still think there's a lot of work need to be done and uh, certainly there are some solutions out there but i would like to hear cole's thoughts on that before i go into some solutions i mean you know the biggest thing for us to come across was is really you know everything for us is internal so security is you know we have all the foundation that we need um, but it was definitely uh, less of a, a priority at the beginning for us now everything has sort of changed in this COVID world that we now live in it was really easy for everything to be managed when it was all under one roof but as soon as then that separates out then it becomes a whole new sort of um, you know management ballpark for us um, but uh, yeah and, and you guys mentioned, you know, uh, the cloud provider providing a lot of that security. Which cloud providers are you guys using today? Cole, I, I know your answer, but I'm going to let you answer it. Um, yeah, it's uh, we use Azure. Yeah. Yeah, we, we use Microsoft Azure too. Uh, uh, but but having said that, I worked with AWS before, um, and even they, they do a good job with it. I think most of the cloud providers do a good job with it. But yes, we do use Microsoft Azure. On our yeah, side. And, and we're the same. And we've used all the three majors, um, which would be AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. Um, but for us, so much of our work is in Azure, just because the types of companies that we're commercializing solutions for are big Microsoft partners. And so it really takes some of the effort out of integrating uh, a lot of authorization stuff for their organization, for people able to log in through their Active Directory and still have access to maybe the data or BI tools that exist. It makes that a lot yeah. simpler. Um, but to your point, I mean, from a from a performance and functionality perspective, they're all doing the same thing, which is taking open source software that someone else wrote and hosting it on a solution that they have and then charging for it a lot of money. Very smart business. Yeah, we should have asked Microsoft to sponsor this event. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> they owe us for this one. <laughs> um, last question before we are able to open it up to, to the rest of folks here to have a Q&A session is, you know, what do you guys think are going to be that next wave of IoT innovations and what's currently holding it back right now? Um, Cole. Yeah. Um, so really, I hope that Creature Comfort stands as what the next wave is, which is that smaller companies can enter into this space and be successful in it. Um, you know, the biggest fear for us was lack of education, right? Or to feel that this world was very daunting because the early conversations were about, again, how you collect terabytes of data, how you then turn it into advanced algorithms and how you dump it out so it's always actionable, right? And at the end of the day, we are confident in our business and know what's actionable. And then it was just working that step backwards. Um, and so I really hope that with those people who are just thinking about it, that you know that if you are a small company, that it's at least worth the exercise to figure out what that would be, what that solution is going to be for you. Because yes, two years ago was very daunting, but now that as we sit and, and feel very fortunate to get to talk about it, I can tell you that it's um, been incredibly beneficial, you know, beneficial for us. But it, it wasn't a, a very hard road to get to. 
Yeah. So, I, and and I think you know one thing. I would, I'm just looking at the uh, the title of uh, our panel, right? It says innovation while riding the IoT tsunami. Uh, certainly, the IoT tsunami is is true now. It's no longer a buzzword. Uh, everybody is venturing into it. I think, like Cole said, if you know exactly what business problem you're trying to solve with the connectivity costs going down and cloud becoming more and more easy to use uh, and the network operators making things more and more easier as well. Now you have different kinds of band, right? It's no longer just, uh, it's 3G is gone, or at least about to go away. It's 4G, LTE, now 5G is on the way, although it's still myth, so to speak. It's still, we still need to see reality. It's still in bits and pieces sporadically, uh, but, um, uh, and then you have NBIoT, there's other bands coming into the picture as well. So we have multiple technologies enabling you to do your IoT much more easily. So it's no longer the complexity that should stop you, although operational aspects you need to think through. Uh, it's really the business problem that you're after need to be thought through. So, but it's coming. Everybody is thinking, and as long as you have the right problem to solve. Uh, going back to your original question, um, there's a lot of areas I think are going to go in more and more connected, especially if anything, this current COVID situation told us uh, being remote is uh, you cannot take it for granted that you're going to be there in front of things all the time, right? You have to be able to operate in order to be successful from remotely. Uh, if you don't have, I think most of the companies, even if you're watching the stock market, you have Netflix, Zoom, and these things are the one going up, right? And they are even the companies who are able to operate remotely, who are able to sustain so um, certainly the, that would change the industry, in my opinion, in the next few years, because it's in everybody's minds, even if COVID completely gone, which I'm really hoping it's gone in the next month or so, although the cases are not helping. Uh, but even if it's completely gone, this whatever that happened, the global pandemic, it's in everybody's minds. So people have to be prepared for something like this in future. So more and more IoT solutions are gonna come for sure. Uh, one, if I have to pick one specific area, I would think service industry. Uh, the service industry is certainly it has to be uh, remote because right now, if you say service, you feel the service guy is going to be right in front of you. That may no longer be the case all the time. Um, so people would like to see remote service options as much as possible, which we know from our, our point of view, we certainly jumped into the bandwagon as soon as that happened, although we were already using it. But across the company, right, that is one of the initiatives kind of jumped out uh, for us, right? So, so that's one area I would think uh, it, it might uh, uh, take off a bit on, uh, from IoT point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And it really does seem like so many more things are getting connected. And, and to your point, which I hadn't thought of before, this really did, I think, escalate or speed up the right. death of traditional service and retail and all that kind of stuff and everything's moving into a more digital world because quite right. frankly, we're very frail as a species and we don't need to be that involved with the physical world. We're, we're kind of figuring out how to move past that, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, for, for me, when I start to think about that and I start to think about some of the tactical issues that we face in IoT installations is this concept of identity and, and security, which is I see a lot of solutions that are making a ton of sense in the industrial and commercial sector because there's there's an ownership. I, if I have to install something into a building and that building manager owns that solution, it's an easier thing to manage. It's very difficult when I bring IoT solutions to the consumer for, for a lot of different reasons, but the primary one, I think, is connecting that initial connection of a device to the cloud. And yeah. there's, we're definitely making headway in that. And I think the, um, there's a new working group between like Apple, Amazon, and Google called Connected Home IP, which is working on protocols to help us make that initial connection and then the proof and the authorization of that device to say like i am this person i'm registered with you as a service this is my right. device it is now okay to connect this thing um, i think that is the biggest hold up right now to getting things into a a significant making a significant impact in the consumer side of things right now is that yeah. initial connectivity point yeah very cool um, all right, we do have a few questions. Is there anything else you guys want to say on that topic before we jump into some of these questions that we're receiving from the audience? No, it's been it's been great. Like I said, I I, I cannot. I think we started the conversation with value at least when I opened uh, my statement, but I ended with value. So anybody who wants to enter into the space, 
um, beyond POC, please look for uh, what the value that's going to bring to you and your customers. That's that's pretty critical. 100% agree. That's yeah. where it started for us and, and where we continue to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's where we've shifted a lot of our, our organization started as this purely software engineering. We shifted so much into the earlier stages in that research and having a capable um, market research capabilities um, for that same reason, which is validating and proving that a solution is going to work in the long term is the harder part of actually, it's harder than implementing it, Yeah, especially the great tools that we have today. Absolutely. Right. Um, so one of the questions that we had from the audience was, as we're collecting all this information, how are you guys thinking about privacy and, and securing that data and, and, and giving appropriate uh, controls to that data? Um, so, you know, I would say, uh, again, our world is very um, insular. Um, so we do have very different conversations about it. Um, the, the always thing that I had struggled with in the past is when, when we think of privacy, it also feels like it can be a wall to have engagement and to have people have confidence that they can go find the information that they need to. Um, so really how we've always just tried to dictate it on the insular side is to make sure that um, we empower individuals to continue to ask questions um, and that we do everything we can to you know, protect where we need to protect, but keep it as open as possible so people can engage with the tools that we've created for them. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we definitely follow through the typical policies that are this GDPR and CPA, California Protection Data Laws. Uh, we follow all of those uh, to make sure to protect our customers and ourselves as well. Um, so that's that's kind of part of our solutions. And we have the way that we uh, do today, we have a platform. Uh, we built our own IoT platform on top of Microsoft Azure. So the platform has some of those controls baked in. So with that in place, any new solutions we're going to build uh, will get some other production already. And now, uh, from controls point of view, uh, we build various authorization um, checks and balances in our platform. So you, as a user, when you're using it, you're only allowed to see what your whoever the administrator has given controls for. So the data leaks are not going to happen. And uh, our platform is also multi-tenant. So essentially, it's a combination of supporting the multi-tenancy and uh, authorization controls and then following the industry best practices. Um, but but yes, so privacy and, and data controls are uh, very critical because uh, you can you can certainly be get into trouble if you don't think through them um, and you can just finish up the product and you can try to sell it, but then later on you will get into trouble if you don't think through them. Good question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And have you guys ran into any data governance tools? Like I've seen Calibra out there, um, the types of tools that allow us to uh, sort of segment who has access to data for analytics purposes and those sorts of things. Yeah, so so from our side, we are doing the data controls right now without even going into the um, uh, the any in, internal IT tools at this point, right? So what we do is we are providing solutions to our customers so all they can see is the applications that we provide so all those controls are through the authorization mechanism in our platform underneath we are using different it tools behind the scenes but for customer point of view that's all they get yeah makes sense and, and um, really good to have you back for some of these questions go ahead cole oh and i was just going to say so again as we try and navigate this space to uh, those um Analytics platforms for us do give us those levels of control as well in terms of, you know, funneling certain information to certain individuals. And Lily, the data that you guys are collecting can be considered so sensitive. What are you guys doing on your side to, to manage privacy? Well, we do not capture, um, save uh, any health, any uh, personal information from anyone. So uh, it's really, the privacy is really not a relative um, area in, in, in the type of data that we capture. Um, I mean, all we capture is, uh, you know, when the light comes on or when the toilet is flushed or when the TV comes on or when there is movement in the house. Um, so we're sort of um, safe when it comes to data privacy in that, area, in that manner. Yeah, and it, for the most part, it's it's a similar. We try to avoid collecting the user information uh, for the most part. Yeah. And even in a well-architected IoT solution, so much of the data is 
not relevant by itself, right? You have your telemetry yes. data that's getting streamed into one location, and maybe there, there's some associated identifiers that take it back to the real data that would indicate who a user is or who a customer is. But you know, that data by itself is just, like Willie said, it's just a door opened at this point in time. I'm not gonna tell you whose door it was because you can't figure it out, right? Um, right. And that, what's great, and the great part about that, of course, is when you get into healthcare and you get into HIPAA compliance solutions, just by building the solution correctly, and the way you're supposed to build an IoT solution, kind of gets you a lot of the way there. Yeah. And, and you know, Cole, we don't save the data at all. Once the data is gathered, uh, analyzed, you know, machine learning starts making sense out of it, then we delete it. So it's not stored anywhere um, uh, in the back ends or in the cloud or anything. So. Cool. Another question came from the audience for for you, and I think the question would also uh, apply to Lily as well, which is, um, what did you guys do to kind of sell the business case of data and connectivity operations uh, up to your your you know the folks that are actually in charge and dispersing those funds? I hope um, I said the question right. You know, for me, what I would you know. One of Creature's big sayings is crave curiosity. If you've seen any of our light bulb logos, you're likely to see that there. Um, so I'm very thankful for the Creature family to uh, embrace this idea with me and, and move forward with it. Um, for, you know, it's what we keep echoing. It's really, it's just like, like I knew deep down that we needed a solution to effectively answer questions because that at the end of the day, it was gonna help us make a better product. It was gonna help improve the lives of the people around me. Um, and so that was not a hard selling pitch. What is then the hard selling pitch is uh, communicating and educating our company on what IoT is, you know, all the other subsidiary components that are going to be involved in this process, and why each of them are important to make sure that the system is is simple yet effective. And, and Lily, you know, you guys are, you know, you're self-funded as you as you, <laughs> so you had to convince yourself. And how how are you able to do that? Honestly, um, uh, Joe, yeah, we are self-funded. We've um, invested a lot of our own personal money. That's why I'm not going around shopping or ordering stuff online. But anyway, um, uh, honestly, the idea of this product is so, it sells itself. I mean, the minute that we talk about to anyone, whether it's uh, an individual, whether uh, the caregiver or the senior, or insurance companies or independent living. I mean, as soon as we tell them that we're working on a product that doesn't have any camera, uh, doesn't listen to words, um, it's it's not intrusive. I mean, they did that their immediate question and, and, and investors immediate question is, when is it coming out in the market? Uh, you know, when can we buy it? Uh, how do we invest? Um, so, but what we're looking for, we want to continue being self-funded, uh, as I mentioned, that the help that we need is we're looking for strategic partners. Um, and um, as we get closer, maybe in about a month or so, we're going to, um, we're going to start um, taking advantage of the ones that have approached us. Um, so we can start some partnership, but we're, you know, we're still looking, so if anyone uh, knows of any strategic partners that have already invested in the type of business that have the same customers as we do, uh, like the independent living um, environments, organizations, uh, we would appreciate it. Just contact me. Yeah, fantastic. And then Sridhar, uh, the same question actually applies to you, but you're on the, the other side of that, which is you're the one that's saying, yes, no, you know, that's not a good solution. This is a good solution. We should invest money in this one. What are some of the key things that, that you're looking for uh, when someone's uh, coming to you and saying, we should do this as a business? Uh, so it, 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 for us, it's a little bit of uh, involved process because I'm at the corporate level uh, and my responsibility is working with all the companies underneath. We do partner up with, it's a collaborative relationship and uh, we do a bunch of things uh, from our point of view, even when this idea comes, whether it's through us or through the business, uh, we take that idea and we go through uh, VOCs, voice of the customer surveys first, uh, making sure that we get the enough feedback. Uh, we take the feedback, we mix it up with what we know capabilities. Um, and then finally, we draft an ROI before we make a, a go no go decision. So it is a bit of a process involved. It's not like somebody's wakes up with the idea and then we just run with it for sure. 
Uh, there's a lot of checks and balances all the way from top to bottom. So we don't, we usually start at the top. Uh, it's a top driven approach. Uh, previously it used to be uh, down below where someone makes a POC and then we'll try to productize it. Now it's other way around. We start with the business, making sure that there's a business case and there is a VOC stand properly. Um, and, uh, and and then we go. In fact, we sometimes we do have POC just to show an industry uh, trade shows and all to make sure it's how it's well received and we gather some feedback before we actually seriously jumping in. But that's our approach. Yeah, and we and we take a similar approach, obviously, as well, making that business case first. Um, if someone else from the from the audience had a question for you, Sridhar, because they had really uh, what you had said about the service industry um, and how it has to change pretty pretty rapidly, and that maybe IoT is a solution that's going to be helpful to them. Do you see the same thing happening in grocery stores, especially around restocking shelves and knowing when an item's been in there for too long? Oh, absolutely. There's actually um, we have we have companies approaching us. Given we are in uh, one of our segment is the refrigeration segment, where we uh, we we have to do with the doors and the shelves, uh, both on the uh, refrigeration side as well as the food uh, food and retail food retail. Uh, so we do have companies approaching us. But but yeah, absolutely. That space is already being looked upon uh, to figure out the inventory checks uh, and uh, how do we be able to sell. The products better given you're already there by connecting back into the advertising market uh, but absolutely that place is iot is being absolutely being thought about uh, especially in the COVID. again we are tying it back to the covid if you look at some of the panic that created and people are going and hoarding the actually all the um, <laughs> for all everything in all of these the toilet papers but keeping that aside even the food right the milk and eggs and everybody i'm sure you guys had a tough time getting more than one or two because they, they had to ration uh, uh, on one end there was a supply chain problem where uh, the people who are producing the products are saying we don't know where to send and they're actually wasting the food uh, and then the other on the other end you have markets are saying the stores are saying we don't have the food so there are certainly improvements that can be made to connect these two pieces together absolutely um, and as as a, a company that lives in that supply chain Right. I mean, that sort of insight is going to be would be huge for us uh, yeah. to understand when to restock. Yeah. yeah. I think if, you, if anyone's looking for a business case out there, anything related to consumables is, is probably, you know what I mean? The way to go. If there's if there's something that is going to get ingested or consumed or used or something like that, and there's some sort of device that can dispense yeah. it in some way. It's a very easy way to create a business case, which is let me tell you when you need more of that and pay I'll order it for you. Yeah. All right, so we are we are wrapping up here to bring Steve back on to the show. There he is. Hey, Steve. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Hey, Joe, Cole, Sridhar, Lily, absolutely fabulous job. Your obvious experience in the industry, getting us close to what you're doing with customers or your customer yourself, Cole, and Lily, what your vision is for the future is just tremendously exciting and you know, I, I, I think um, there's been a lot learned uh, for everybody tonight, and we really, really appreciate your time and your insights. Thank, Have a you. Good yeah. thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Terrific. Thank and we'll see, we'll, we'll see you when we know where to find you, and we're going to call you back. Thank you. <laughs> right, Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Well, I hope everybody had a phenomenal hour together with us. I know I learned a lot, and I know there are a lot more that our panelists could have shared with us. But we got tonight behind us. I need you all to mark your calendars for July 16th, third Thursday in July. We have a phenomenal event coming, driven by our Women Driving Innovation team, all about 5G. Get a real update of what it is and get out of that confusion of just because it says 5G on your phone and in other places, is it real, where it's gonna show up, and I think you're gonna find it very enlightening and tremendously educational. Also need you to mark your calendar for August 20. Learn about virtual care and telehealth. We're putting that panel together and we'll let you know a little more about it in the next couple of weeks. Check our website and um, Keep an eye on your emails as well, but uh, 
we got two phenomenal panels and help everybody wrap up the summer. And during that time, we're also checking with the governor, CDC, and trying to figure out what the plan is for moving forward for future events in, in 2020. Notwithstanding where it's going to be, we will have one every month on the third Thursday of every month except December. And as always, let me take a moment again to thank our sponsors, Bright Point, Carabiner, Stone Resource Group, Stable Colonel, and Cox. If any of you are interested in joining these sponsors and being a sponsor for the forum, A, we would appreciate your support. We know we can get you some great exposure and build some phenomenal connections, whether it's in person or online. We seem to be pretty well wired or unwired and untethered, but we would love to hear from you. Drop an email to sponsors at atlantainnovationforum.org. Thanks a lot. So in wrapping up, let me thank everybody. Thank our team for putting on a great event. Thank our speakers, thank our sponsors, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules and long days to join us. We'll see you next month. Have a good evening.